Welcome to the Digital Footprint, a podcast for leaders in healthcare, public health, and education who are looking to leverage technology to solve problems and make a big impact. In each episode, we interview innovators and entrepreneurs who are solving the most challenging problems facing these industries. Join us as we dig into the colossal tasks involved in bringing a new digital product to life. Welcome to the Digital Footprint. Hello and welcome to the Digital Footprint. I'm Richard Sims and this podcast is brought to you by Tyrannosaurus Tech, an award-winning technology partner dedicated to designing and developing high-impact software products. We have a great guest today, Ed Thomas, co-founder and CEO of 412 Technology. Ed, really excited to have you on the show. Thank you, Richard. I'm really excited to be here. Very cool. So you and I were first introduced, um, I think, a little over a year ago at this point. And I've really enjoyed just getting to know you and following, you know, your journey with uh, your product, Arbor. It's a very cool product. I know it's already having a, a huge impact, you know, relatively er- early on in the journey, which which is awesome. And I'm really looking forward to just digging into the details a little bit more with you today. Um, so to jump right in and just get started, um, do you mind just taking, you know, 60 seconds or so to quickly introduce yourself and just tell folks about 412 technology and what, what you're up to with uh, Arbor specifically? Yeah, you bet. Happy to. And again, thank you for having me on the uh, on the show this afternoon. I really appreciate it. Um, I've been a big fan, so uh, it's exciting to be, uh, get to actually take part. Um, so yeah, as you mentioned, my name is Ed Thomas. I'm the CEO and co-founder of 412 Technology. Um, and in that role, I take care of everything from product design work to overseeing some of our marketing activities, um, fundraising, and kind of everything in between. Um, and we are aggressively staffing up right now. So it's an it's exciting time to be part of the organization. Um, and we're quickly building a really great team of individuals around it. Let me tell you, though, about our core product, which is called Arbor. So Arbor is a marketplace for consumers to find out and to back specific carbon removal projects. What we've seen as being people in the climate change space is that there's a ton of really great work that's happening that's really focused on directly removing carbon from the atmosphere. Obviously that carbon is what's causing the climate crisis that we're seeing right now. Um, These are projects that are everything from urban forestry projects or uh, or reforestation projects that often are overseas or here in the States um, to things like green rooftops or direct air capture, um, even some really cool stuff coming out of lab work right now around engineered materials and stuff like that. What Arbor is, is it's really the central place for all of those different projects to come together to raise the funding that they need to continue and to expand their carbon removal work directly from consumers who want to help reverse climate change. So in that way, you can kind of think of us almost as like a Kickstarter for climate change or something like that. Um, So for instance, say you're an average Atlantan, you know, you've got a decent sized house, maybe use natural gas for cooking and for, uh, and and for heating your home. You know, you drive an SUV, come to and from work, you know, in in non COVID times, at least, um, you know, every day you're probably generating somewhere between one and two tons of carbon every month, right? Which obviously is a lot, even on an individual basis, but then particularly once you start to roll that up across the entire society, that's a ton of carbon dioxide that we're generating. Through our platform, you can fund projects out there that are actively removing that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Or if you want to go a step further, you can fund a little bit more than that and really become part of the climate change solution right, and help roll back um, the global carbon levels uh, across the board for all of us. Um, and so we're really excited about it because we're, we see this as a way for um, average users to have a direct impact and to really take charge and uh, become part of the climate change solution. Awesome. Yeah, that's, it's very cool. And, you know, climate change is such a huge challenge. I think it's daunting. And at times, it's hard to, you know, remain optimistic about it. But Sounds like you all definitely are and kind of have faith in individuals coming together collectively to, you know, rise to the challenge. And I I think that's what a lot of people struggle with is like, what can I actually do in my day to day? Um, So I think that's that's very neat that you all are kind of uh, bridging that gap and giving people uh, a way to do that, you know, that that's pretty intuitive and 
uh, accessible. So uh, I love it. So how did you all come across, or how did this idea develop? You know, what was the original idea? Did it kind of morph over time? Was there a particular aha moment that, you know, pushed you all over the edge to pursue this as a, a separate venture? I'd love to hear some of the, the background there too. Yeah, 100%. Well, and, and, and Richard, I think he really hit the, the nail on the head from our standpoint, which is that, you know, climate change is this massive, massive problem that we're all facing, right? And we're, we're already seeing the impacts of it, right? From it being, you know, mid 80s in early April to, you know, the hurricanes that we're seeing every fall to the fire season that we're now seeing on the West Coast. Um, you know, we're starting to really see some of these impacts. And um, I think we're, we're as a society finally starting to realize, you know, what's going on around us. Um, we take a different tack, though, I think, than a lot of folks. So the, the solution that a lot of people come to is, you know, it's such a big problem, it's got to be solved by somebody else, right? It's got to be solved by corporate America, Google's got to step in and save us somehow, or it's got to be a government solution or some intragovernmental solution or super governmental solution like the UN that's got to try to coordinate some massive effort. And the position that we took in studying this problem and really researching it is that we actually all have the power to be part of the solution, right? It's all of us who got us into this mess in the first place, right? Through naivete or, you know, just not fully realizing what's going on. Um, you know, we're the people that, that caused this crisis. You know, it's really us that can help us get out of this. And so what we started to do is we said, well, what is it, what can we do that just make it easy for average consumers like you and me who are reading the news and panicking about what's going on and seeing the impact that we're starting to see on the climate crisis around us? What can we do? Uh, what can we make? How can we create something that is a easy, simple platform um, for, po for folks to take direct action and to have a direct impact? And that was really the genesis for Arbor. Um, there is a ton of really exciting project work that's going on already out there in the world, um, all of which has the opportunity and the ability to really have an impact and to not just, you know, stop the rate that they're, that things are getting worse, right, which is kind of step one that everyone's focused on, but then take that second step that we're really focused on of saying, hey, how can we start to improve things and remove the carbon that we've emitted over the past 200 years from the atmosphere and get the, the planet back on to a long-term, more sustainable, sustainable pathway? Um, those, that work is already there. We have the technology, you know. We've got the electrification ability to, to, to decarbonize the grid as part of that first step of not making the problem any worse. Um, and we also have the, the technologies to, to, to get us that next step by starting to remove it, right? And unwind the problem and improve things. Um, you know, some of the people joke that, uh, you know, we're the, the most high tech way to plant a tree, <laughs> right? Because a lot of what we're doing is things like reforestation, right? And, and habitat reconstruction that has a, an impact on removing carbon levels from the atmosphere. And so again, our, our focus is on, you know, how do we make it easy for you to take a small little step, you know, and for, you know, what's typically a couple dollars a month for most average users, to unwind the impact of that tank of gas that you had to buy to, to fill up your SUV to go to work? You know, how do we make it easier for you to unwind the impact of the electrical usage at your house? You know, just simple steps like that, um, that really have a dramatic impact when you start to think about all of us as a community collectively taking these actions together and coming together to solve the problem, whether corporate America gets on board or our, our governmental leaders take charge and actually um, start working on the problem or not. There's things that we can do today to make things better. Absolutely. So what was kind of the progression of initially having this idea, you know, identifying kind of a, an opportunity to have a big impact? What was that timeline of that, the early discussions with your co-founder to you all truly pursuing this full time? Was it something you worked on in a limited capacity for a while and then kind of got to, you know, that uh, tipping point and just went for it? Or how did that happen? Yeah, Arbor has been a very different startup than other startups that I've worked on. So this is my fourth business that I've started up. And and typically for other ones, and I know this is more common out there for, for other entrepreneurs as well, um, you identify a problem and you see a solution for it, 
right? And you go, hey man, it, it stinks to get home from the bar late at night after I've had a couple of, two, couple of drinks and I can't get a taxi to come. You know, it'd be really cool if I could tap a button on my phone and have a car show up and take me home, right? And then like years later we have Uber, <laughs> right? Um, Arbor has been very different in that my, my founder and I, we knew we wanted to do something in climate change, right? We knew that we wanted to focus on this area. We also knew that there's a lot of activity and incredibly skilled people and you know, smart folks who are focused on things at the corporate level, right? And how can we you know, make it easier for Apple to make their footprint green and stuff like that. But we said, gosh, there's not really anything that I can do, right? I can go put a tree in my yard or drive a Tesla. Or, you know, there's, I put solar panels on the house if I'm in the right spot. But like, you know, all these are pretty limited and it's just a one-off impact for just me. Gosh, there's gotta be something better. And so we kind of put the stake in the ground and we said, all right, well, we're gonna do that. And we don't know what that is, but we're gonna do that, <laughs> right? And then we spent, um, Gosh, the better part of six months trying to identify what's the that, right? And we looked at everything from like renewable energy credit trading to some opportunities on the blockchain to, I mean, all across the board. And, you know, we finally realized, hey, there, there's this whole universe of projects that are kind of small and mid-size and tend to be underfunded. Um, they tend to work with and focus on underserved and underprivileged communities, right? Which is cool in its own right. And they're desperate for capital. Wow, what if there's a way that we could bring this, this portfolio of carbon removal projects to the broader marketplace? And can we create something that's fun and exciting that users would enjoy using that would enable them to, to fund these projects out there that are doing real world work and having a real impact and, and need help and support? And that was kind of the genesis of Arbor. And, um, you know, we've focused from day one on really kind of evolving that concept in concert with, you know, a core of a couple hundred users who are kind of our testing community and our initial customer base. And, you know, constantly refining and iterating on that with them to get to the, the point that we're at now. And I, I should say as a kind of background preface, um, we're probably two months out from a uh, public launch. So we're planning on launching probably two or three months, probably mid to late summer of this year. Um, and are working on some exciting kind of final pieces of that product experience that will really make the product sing. Um, so, but yeah, it's been a very different journey, I think, than most, feel folk, most folks do. Um, where like, we didn't have that epiphany moment. It's been, more of a, it's been more of a process of sculpture, right? Where we started with a chunk of marble and we've just been yeah. kind of hacking off little pieces here and there. And then suddenly we go, oh, it's, you know, hopefully it's turning into the Pieta and not into, you know, something I would have done in third grade. Um, right. and, and we're in the process of still refining that right now. Yeah, I think that's great. And what I like is, you know, I, I think in the startup world, there there is kind of the saying, fall in love with uh, the problem, not the solution. And it sounds like you all very much heeded that advice, you know, ultimately derail your chances of success if you're so fixated on the solution that you're passionate about, really, you need to just be looking for the best way to address a particular problem and open-minded ultimately about what that solution looks like. And that's part of just facilitating pivots and being really iterative, as you've said, through the early stages of a startup. So I think that's great. Um, so we all know startups are very hard and this is not your first rodeo. So I think you knew that going into it, but um, what would you say have been the, the biggest challenges so far with, with Arbor and how have you all overcome them? The great question. Um, so, you know, we've, we've hit all of the, the common issues that everyone does, right? Of, you know, lack of funding and things changing in the marketplace. And um, we were chasing down one concept initially and, you know, thank God got legal advice early on and realized actually that was probably illegal, right? So we said, okay, we, can't, <laughs> we probably shouldn't do that. Um, we don't want to violate securities regulations. Um, and, and so we've, we've dealt with all those issues that I think are very common to a, uh, to a startup. Um, the, the one that we've really, I think, struggled with the most um, is that community engagement on the product development process, right? So what I, what I mentioned just now is that we've tried to be very intentional about 
working with our community of early users and early adopters to identify the solution that they are really excited about, right? Realizing full well that what I think and what I believe is cool and exciting doesn't really matter unless I'm going to spend millions of dollars on my own product, right? It, what matters is what everyone else thinks is really cool and exciting and impactful. Um, and, the, and the challenge with, it, with that is continually engaging those folks, right? And, and not burning that community out. You know, it's, it's all I'm thinking about, right? Every moment of the day I'm spent focused on Arbor and thinking about how can we improve this? And what if we did this? And hey, wouldn't it be cool if we included this? And, you know, we should blast out this to the, okay, that's just me though, right? I, I've got to be very cognizant of how much time and attention I'm demanding from, you know, these folks that are helping us out in this journey. Um, and, and, you know, treating that as the most valuable resource in our in our early business, which it is at this point, um, and making sure that we engage that community effectively and and, uh, and in a way that, like I said, um, you know, takes most advantage of their time and their capabilities. Um, but it's also been wonderful to see just, you know, we'll throw a, a, an update to the app out and it'll be, you know, we changed some language here or there and we improved a photo or something, you know, just something minor. <laughs> And to get like five emails back from folks that are like, hey, I saw what you did on screen four. That's really cool. I love what your changes are. Hey, have you thought about doing this now? Right? And that's the sort of thing that as an entrepreneur you live for, to get that sort of engagement and excitement from, uh, from a user base is something I think that's really special and, and makes me excited about the future for Arbor. I'm very optimistic about our, our pathway and our trajectory. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and it's great that it sounds like you've got some really engaged early adopters. And of course, for for folks listening, I mean, I think with any startup, it's like you can never focus too much on the envisioned customer or user, right? right. Like they're going to tell you infinitely more uh, when when kind of rubber meets the road as far as getting in there and using an application you know, they're, they're going to give you way more insights than you can in just strategizing and uh, thinking on hypotheticals because people ultimately behave very different than what they might tell you they want. <laughs> so obviously, obviously, I think you all have done the right thing, getting it out there. And I am lucky enough to have it uh, on my phone from the test flight invite. And it's super cool. Um, it's looking great. Like, I'm very excited for the, the broader launch and um, yeah, I think that that progression, uh, it, you know, makes a lot of sense and just getting people on it sooner rather than later. Well, and it's, it's also a fine line to walk to though. So I, I've seen other startups stumble in being too responsive, right? Mm, yeah. And so there, there is a fine line that you have to walk, I think, between understanding what your consumers need and getting into their headspace and what they're looking for and what they'll really respond to versus taking the feedback at face value, right? right? And I think that's part of the magic of entrepreneurship is getting, understanding your users well enough that you can go, okay, I, I, I'll ask you the question on what you think of this, this or that, but I know already what you're gonna say, because I know you <laughs> well enough at this point from all of our interactions and everything I've seen and right, that like, I kind of know what you're going to want. Right. So to, to digress, like there's always the story about, you know, Steve Jobs never did any user testing at Apple and just invented the iPhone, which is total bull hockey. Right. Like <laughs> Apple's one of the most aggressive user testing environments in the in the world today. They just do it differently. Right. And they take it from a perspective of, you know, I need to understand everything about you and how you react and what your problems are and issues are. And, and I don't really care if when I put something in front of you, you say you like it or not per se, like, cause I, cause that's my job is figuring out that solution, that product, but I need to understand how it fits well within your experience and where you are as a person. Right. right. And so I think right. there's, there's a real magic line in, in, in identifying how that and how to take feedback. Right. Because, um, you know, if, uh, if everyone just listened exactly to what users want, you know, I, we would probably be on, you know, Yahoo email still, which embarrassingly right. I still use, but like, wasn't it uh Henry Ford that was like, if I, if I built what people asked for, I would have just made a faster horse. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. That's what, yeah, that's the story. The critical thing is that he realized, oh, people just want to move faster. Right. They right. say they want a horse. 
But what they really want to do is get to the next town over in less than a day. Right, right. Oh, I okay, think, well, um, what are the ways that we can solve that? And, and that's, the, that's that understanding your user mindset, I think. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting point. Like, there's definitely a fine line there between understanding them, their motivations, the fundamental kind of pain points you're trying to address versus trying to give someone what they say they want. And and certainly what we see folks do sometimes too, especially with an early product, is like you really want to constrain the scope and not allow yourself to get pulled in a bunch of different directions. So, you know, also I know when you're testing with folks, although they have the best intentions, sometimes they're like, well, you know, it'd be really cool too if it integrated with LinkedIn here or there was you know, I could take a picture with the app too, to, you know, and sometimes you got to like put the the guardrails back on and say, maybe in the future, but you know, I can't be pulled in 10 different directions. That's not the core value we're trying to bring. So yeah. um, you're right. Or, or taking that for what actually is going on, right? Hey, you say that you want to be able to take a picture with the app. Okay, well, and, and there's a, a famous process that Toyota goes through on this of like, I think it's the five whys, right? You keep asking why until you get down to like a root motivation for something. You know, you want to take a photo. Why is that? Well, I want to show it to my friends. Why do you want to show it to your friends? Well, because I want them to know that I'm, you know, actively offsetting and doing all this great stuff for the environment. Well, why do you want to do that? Well, because it's important for me to be seen among my friends as being someone who's green and environmental. Well, why is that important? Well, because that's my self-perception of myself. Oh, okay. So if I get after that core issue, that's the key. Whether it takes photos or not doesn't really matter. Like that was just, as the user, you jumped from where I was as a starting point to, hey, I'd like to be able to take a photo. But you know what? Hey, maybe there's a better way of achieving that core, you know, self-reflection, self-analysis that we can do and provide to you. That doesn't have anything to do with photos. That's not really what you're asking for. What you're asking for is five levels down. And and again, it's that kind of understanding of where your users are really coming from and what they're talking about. You know, for for us, it's people feel, um, you know, a lack of uh, personal efficacy, obviously, around climate change. You don't feel like you can do anything, right? So you kind of feel impotent within the face of all this. Um, you feel guilty that you're not doing enough, right? So, um, you know, one of our huge, huge focuses is, you know, how do we make you feel good how do we make you not this isn't a guilt purchase this isn't you know i'm buying carbon credits you know so i can go and pollute more it's hey this is me being a positive member of society it's an expression of my responsibility and my sense of sort of communal well-being and a part of this community and it's it's a statement of optimism around what the future can be right how do we tap into that because that's really what the core of the process is for us Right. But, you know, getting to that understanding takes uh, takes a lot, it takes a long time. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think, you know, one thing that's that's very cool about kind of your journey with Arbor is, you know, you have a, a really rich background in tech and innovation. So I think it's, of course, so obvious from this conversation, not that I would have thought otherwise, but, you know, all the right questions to ask and how to be just very methodical about, you know, what you're building and, and um, you know, just kind of using, having the right paradigm through that process. So one, one question I had for you is more on the technology side, you know, even though, again, I know you've, you've kind of been in this space for a long time, but designing and developing a mobile app from scratch always a big undertaking, even in our line of work, we'll be the, the first to volunteer that. This is not a, you know, yeah, we'll we'll build it out in a few weeks and it's going to look great and function perfectly. There's, there's a lot that goes on there. Um, so with Arbor specifically, just from a technology perspective, what's what's been the biggest challenge for you all getting things implemented and up and running and uh, that whole process? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I mean, the flip answer is just development hours, <laughs> right? Because <Yep. laughs> you know, with enough time and attention and enough number of teams, you can build anything, right? And and you could build the Taj Mahal in two weeks if you had ten million people to do it, right? Um, you know, for for us, we made the decision to go on to a uh, a cross platform framework from day one, right? So we're built on Flutter, which then can be published onto both iOS and Android. Um, you know, it's the, the next great version of React Native, right? Or 
phone gap if people are old enough to remember phone gap and uh, xamarin and some of the other cross platforms from the early days um that's been huge for us and that's really expedited our ability to to develop and deliver products and to iterate rapidly um and particularly right now we're in kind of a rapid um uh, iteration and ideation phase of the business and so being able to kind of write once and publish twice is a huge uh, huge benefit um you know the the thing that's really interesting about our business and i guess digital technology more broadly right now richard is that it's it all exists you know like there were i have some friends that actually run startups that are like actually doing like science right and trying to like right, right. you know their success is going to be you know contingent on their ability to like achieve x in the lab right like, we don't have that constraint right we just we have a a a product that can be built using off-the-shelf componentry right now. Um, it's really a matter for us of you know, how do I really intelligently scope it, right? Um, and you hit the, you know, you, you kind of hit the nail on the head earlier because it's an issue of how do I scope it in such a way that it's, it is the, the nascent kernel of that lovable product that I'm trying to get to, right? Because you can have gargantuan scope that's just kind of a big hot mess right and it there's nothing clearly exciting in all of this it's just kind of this unfocused mishmash you can also scope it so tightly that it's not lovable anymore right like you can see kind of a core functionality to it but all you did is prove that you can hook up a core functionality um and if i'm being honest that's kind of where arbor started when we launched it back in in november into our into our uh, our closed beta group you know, it was just a platform that you can buy carbon offsets from, right? Not, not a whole lot's lovable about that. And we've kind of refined that and refined that. Now we're taking that next step internally of saying, okay, well, let's add some of the lovability component to it to really make it something that users resonate with. Now, I know what lovability looks like if it's, you know, this big, right? If it's a sizable product. But what's that one or two things that are the core component that we can really sort of launch both as a test to see if people actually respond to it like we think they will, but then also as that foundational piece that we can build everything else on. Sure. Yeah, it, it definitely is a very tough balance. And, and we work with a lot of folks on MVPs and typically, um, well, and for listeners, minimum viable product, we are typically the ones really pulling back the scope. Um, and I will always be the first to admit that I am equally guilty of it. If it's my idea, I have a huge vision for it. You know, I, I want to like push forward knowing it's going to be great, build the full vision. But again, a lot of times we'll, we'll try to bring people back um, for, for a lot of good reasons, right? Um, but yes, it's very hard to know what is that line where you don't want the feedback you're getting or the validation you're seeking to be compromised because there's just not quite enough either polish there or, you know, kind of periphery, like user experience outside of that one core value proposition. Right. Um, and I think for Arbor, if this is fair to say, you know, in my experience, just exploring the app so far, just really, um, having a narrative behind those projects is a huge, huge part of it, right? Because they're super interesting. Um, you know, they're very compelling. There's some nice pictures like that alone is such a big difference than just going in and saying, yeah, I'm going to buy some carbon credits. Cause I know that's something I, I should be doing. Right. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, we've, we've also tried to be very intentional about, how do we build a platform that's flexible enough that we can kind of test other things into it, right? Realizing that we're, we're probably going to misfire on the first couple of shots that we take, right? And so, um, you know, if you're, if you're playing around with our app now, we, had, we initially launched with a couple of projects from a partner, but there are three specific projects, right? And, and there's a rationale as to why we pick those and everything. Um, and then, Kind of as we saw people responding and reacting to those, we said, well, what would a different, what would more of like an impact focused project be, right? Like the three that we picked just for your users are just these giant projects overseas of millions of acres that are being protected and replanted and they're spinning up hundreds of millions of tons of carbon savings. Like they're giant, giant, giant projects, which are super exciting. 
but they also fall into the trap of saying, well, my my 10 bucks to that, <laughs> right, is is not even, you know, new deck chairs on the Lusitania. Like it's a drop in a, <laughs> it's a drop in a very, very large bucket. So we said, well, what would it look like if we just, you know, we worked with our partner to sponsor like just a specific little grove. We're going to go protect these hundred trees and try to plant another 50. What would that look like? You know, and, and how would people respond to that sort of project? Okay, we and we learned. Then we said, well, what would happen if we, instead of looking at a project, we sponsored an impact, you know, for a group or for an individual? And so, we, so we found a class and we said, hey, what if we sponsored your classroom and made your classroom totally carbon neutral for the year, right? You're all on Zoom, you're using electricity all day, and da, 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 da. What would it look like if we just offset that? And would our users respond to that and want to fund that instead of funding some of these other projects? And, but, you know, at the core, we kind of built a structure that we could play around with and experiment with these, some of these ideas with. Um, and I think that was the key, that was the key thing that we really got right. Um, you know, I, I wish that we had an even more flexible framework so we could, you know, experiment in a lot of different ways with even other ideas and stuff. But, um, you know, for where we are, we, we're, we're in a good spot for where we, uh, where we needed to get to. Yeah, it definitely seems like it. And, um, you know, obviously just restraints, resource restraints or constraints, I should say, are <laughs> a part of every startup's, you know, struggle. I think some constraints are healthy in terms of making folks focus and find ways to be scrappy. Um, for you all, like what's been kind of the push and pull between budget, time, like searching out the appropriate skill sets? How, how, what's been you all's perspective generally on like what you should be focused on investing in where you should be super scrappy versus, you know, really make the investment now. Just curious what you all's, uh, kind of philosophy on that has been. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we intentionally have been, um, an extraordinarily tight budget, right? So, um, we're a team of eight, I think at this point, if I'm calculating correctly, uh, myself and my co-founder full-time, we've got um, a couple folks who are on part-time and kind of a volunteer position. Um, and then we've got a number of unpaid interns, right? And and we can get away with the unpaid internship a little bit because we, you know, we know how to run teams of young developers and things like that, my partner and I. So, so we're in a position where we can say, yeah, you don't really know the ins and outs of Flutter, but you're a, you know, third or fourth year at Georgia Tech and you're super smart and you want to learn and you're willing to try it and you just want to work hard, come on board, right? We'll teach you everything you need to know. We'll set you up with what you need to be able to succeed. We'll give you a little piece to start with and, you know, and grow you over time, but we'll invest in you in terms of time and energy and effort, you know, right. in return for your active engagement and help in pushing this forward. And we've been fortunate in that, um, you know, we're a, a, a product with a social mission, obviously, that really resonates with a lot of folks. And so we've been able to find some really top flight talent who want to come in and make an investment in us, right, in return for having an impact. And, you know, obviously, when we raise funding, um, you know, we'll hire all those folks on board full time and stuff. So it's a great kind of great kind of way to get in the door early. Yeah. Um, you know, but I think more, more broadly, like, yeah, it's a great opportunity for them to learn and experience and build a resume and a portfolio and have an impact at the same time. Um, so we've been really focused on investing in terms of time and effort and, um, you know, our own personal resources um, versus, you know, going out and raising money initially and then putting that budget to something. And, sure, sure. and I think the point that you hit upon, Richard, is actually the critical one, which is that forces you to be really, really smart on what you do, right? I, so I, full disclosure, I went to Stanford for business school and, you know, the, the Silicon Valley mindset then and now is still very much, you got an idea that sounds great, you go shop it, you raise $2 million, then you're in business and you hire 15 people and then you blow it up and, you know, and like you dump gas on the fire as quickly and as early as you can, right? With, with some variation, but that's kind of the model. And, right. you know, I have friends who have early stage startups that are, you know, top dollar real estate smack in the middle of Palo Alto, like just across the street from Stanford. And I look and I'm like, God only knows what you're paying for office space, right? In an environment now where we're, we 
can't go to the office anyway, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Gee, and I look and I go, geez, if I had, you know, a fifth of what you've spent last month on, you know, your real estate alone, gosh, I could go hire 15 developers and go, you know, build something amazing. But in a way, not having that temptation um, makes you more resourceful, right? It makes you really focus a lot more on like, all right, if there's 50 things I can do, what's the two things today that are going to make this more successful? Because all I can do yeah. is do those two things. I can't worry about the next 48. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think um, some of that perspective on raising capital, you know, there's, I think some of that is like West Coast mentality versus East Coast, particularly Southeast. But I definitely agree with you. I mean, I would say generally our opinion is the longer you can bootstrap, the better if you're progressing. And that ultimately, if you are raising capital, it should be to throw fuel on a fire that is already burning, yes. right? You should already have that spark, like that initial flame, and you have a you know, clear validation, product market fit, you know what you need to do to scale quickly, you know, hire more people, grab a bigger market share. And I think that, of course, the earlier you raise funds too, you know, that changes your situation, the de de degree of control, the, the pressure that's on you, you know, it's very glamorized, but um, it, it is certainly not no strings attached. So uh, I'm with you. I think the constraints are very healthy and and a, a exciting part of the startup journey, you know? 100%. Well, and, and, and it was all, there's also a philosophical decision in the background, right? Like my partner and I didn't feel comfortable going out and raising money from third-party investors until we actually knew we had something. Right. Now, as soon as we know we've got something, game on, right? Like we will raise money, we'll blow it up because we, we need to hit a significant scale to have a significant impact on the climate crisis, right? That's sure. kind of the, the, the model of us is, you know, it's, it's volume of people and users and to get that we need capital. Um, so there's certainly a point in which we're gonna raise money to be able to kind of ramp that growth up. Um, but we wanted to be able to walk into a room and say, no, 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 this is working, right? We're doing this. It works because of these reasons. Every person we get in, here's the retention percentage. Here's the engagement. We know we make X dollars from them on average. Here's what it looks like. And we actually have a, we have a crank we can turn, right? Right, right. And now let's talk about working together to turn that crank faster, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's just a different, it's a, like I say, it was more of a philosophical decision for us. Um, you know, I didn't feel comfortable working with other people's money until we got to the point of knowing that, uh, you know, we actually had de-risked it a little bit, right? And that it sure, wasn't just sure. a total flyer from, from their standpoint. Yeah, definitely. And, and certainly at that point, you come into those conversations just naturally on much better footing if you already have a model in place and, and some, kind of some proof behind what you're doing. So yeah, I think that's great. Um, so for Arbor... I, I saw you all post something that I think already like 25,000 pounds of yeah. carbon emissions have been removed, um, you know, from the Arbor community, which is amazing. So that's a, a big win. Like, are there any other kind of big wins so far with Arbor that you're, you're really proud of, or you're kind of on the cusp of reaching particular goals um, with the product that you want to share? Yeah. Yeah. So that's by far the most exciting one. Um, so for, for context, um, we have a wait list of a couple hundred folks who have signed up who are excited and want to try the app, right, as part of this broader community of folks that we've been building with and, and testing with over the last few months. Um, of that, we've actually only pushed the app out to a few dozen, <laughs> right? The, the idea being, well, you know, I would, I would like to fail with a smaller group than failing with a larger group. So we, we, we intentionally said we're going to limit the number of people using this as we really refine it and, you know, file down all the, the rough edges and whatnot. Um, so, uh, it, but yeah, out of, you know, the few dozen that we've pushed the app out to who have had a chance to play with it, such as yourself, Richard, um, you know, we're, we have double digit rates of folks who purchase through us, which is great because right. that was... I mean, one of the first questions we had was just, hey, if we put this out there, are people going to buy? You know, if I give you the ability to, to offset and eliminate the impact of a tank of gas, are you actually going to do it? 
you know, it costs you three or four bucks. Like that's real money. Like, are you going to spend a couple of bucks to, you know, reduce and eliminate the impact of that tank of gas that you purchased or the, you know, electrical bill that you had last month or whatnot. So it's exciting to see that people actually are purchasing. Um, what's more encouraging is that we have repeat purchases, you know, and it's still double digit percentages of folks who are making repeat purchases every month. Um, you know, and, and these aren't just my friends, I should also preface. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've talked to them now um, because I'm always like, well, what in the hell are you doing? You, this is kind of a kludgy app still. Like, what is it that's making you excited and why are you doing this? Um, you know, and at one point, hopefully I'll get a chance to meet some of them in person because a couple of them are in the Atlanta area. Um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, the early results are exciting. And, and even with that super small base, yeah, we've eliminated 25,000 pounds of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Like, that's huge, right, for a super yeah, small company. And, and, and we look and we go, gosh, think of what happens when we hit a million people, right? Like, okay, now we, we actually, with a straight face, can start talking about, you know, megatons of impact on the climate. And that's really, really impactful. Um, so that's far and away is the most exciting thing. Um, other developments, um, we are, I guess, two other things. So we're close to a, a public launch in the summer, as I mentioned, um, and there's a lot of internal work that's happening around kind of that final definition of what we're going to go to market with. Um, we're super close to an exciting concept. And so I'm really excited to, to get that a little bit further along and start testing that with our, uh, with our beta community. Um, and then we also got um, admitted to a local environmentally and sustainable focused um, accelerator program here in Atlanta, uh, the Greenhouse, which is how you and I got connected initially. Yeah, yeah, it's very cool. And I think it's a great organization. And um, I actually, the last episode we did, I interviewed Matt Cox of GreenLink Analytics, which is kind of how I got introduced to oh, great. Um, that group. So yeah, it's, a, it's come full circle. Yep, it's a small community in Atlanta. Right. So everything always comes back around eventually. Um, but yeah, we're super excited to, to get a chance to work with their team and, and again, really help, you know, bring in a different set of voices and a broader community as we continue to grow the, uh, grow the community around our product. And like I say, um, grow the impact that we're able to have. What advice would you give to someone in the early stages of pursuing a new digital product? Again, I know you've You've done this a number of times. Every situation is different, but what do you think is the most kind of like universal advice that rings true in your experience? So there's so much, right? And, um, you know, I, I feel like probably more so than ever, there's so many little anecdotes and little bits of nuggets of information and whatnot um, that, uh, that, you know, you hear and pick up, you know, from just sort of different sources and podcasts like this and blogs and whatnot. Um, you know, one of the best pieces of advice that I ever got, which certainly holds true in the entrepreneurial and startup context, but also just, you know, is important in general, is don't confuse activity with progress, right? Yeah. It's really, really easy to be super active, right? And responding to emails and posting stuff on LinkedIn and responding to messages on Twitter and, you know, it's really easy to fill your day and then actually not get anything accomplished, right? Um, and so I've tried to be, um, you know, with greater or lesser success, a lot more focused in kind of how I'm spending my time and my activity, right? And, and being very thoughtful about starting the morning and saying, okay, you know, it's Tuesday and it's, you know, it's a beautiful Tuesday in April and it's going to be the only Tuesday in April today that I'm going to have. Right. This is one of my like few thousand days on this planet. What am I going to get done today? And I can pick one or maybe two things and say, I'm going to get those done today. And then, you know, structure everything I'm doing that day around accomplishing that. Right. And then oftentimes I should preface this by saying some of it's like, hey, I'm going to go to the I'm going to go to the soccer game this evening with my kid. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. It, it doesn't have to be business focused, I guess is what I'm saying, but like kind of knowing what you're going to do and how you're going to have an impact, you know, during your existence on that day, I think it's really critical. And then kind of from that, you can start to think more structurally about like, here's the goals and the milestones I'm going to set, you know, and, and in the startup context, you know, knowing, okay, if I, if I want to launch, it's going to have to look like, you know, it's going to have to look like X. 
what do I need to get it to look like X? So I'm going to need these 15 things. Okay, I can't do all 15. Maybe I can do five. What are those five going to be? Right, and setting yourself up milestones and goals, what that, that you can work against and work toward um, helps a ton. Because um, otherwise, it's really easy to, you know, have weeks and months go by and then go, wait, I'll, all I did was these three things. And I had these grand aspirations for what I was going to do the first quarter, right? Um, time right. flies if you're not careful. The other piece of advice I got, which I, I screwed up on with earlier startups, was engage a community as quickly as you can, right? It's, it's really easy to kind of just put your head down and go lone wolf and do, try to do everything yourself. Um, even if you can do everything yourself, and none of us actually can, even though we might think we can, even if you can, you know, you've only got 24 hours in the day, so you're not going to get everything done that you need to. You know, there are folks out there that are also excited about what you're working on who want to get involved. Pull those people in, right? And so, you know, I mentioned earlier with Arbor, we've got a, a decent sized team for not having any budget to speak of right now. Um, you know, it, it was critical that we pull those people in. And, you know, someone could give me a couple of hours a week. Hey, that's a couple of hours that, you know, add on to what we can accomplish. So that's fantastic. Um, and uh, we've, we've really tried to, my, my co-founder and I, just be very intentional about um, trying to engage people and get feedback and get advice and talk with people about what you're working on and get their, get their opinions and thoughts and stuff, get their help if they can, right? But try to engage as broad a community as you can. Yeah, I think those are both very good tips. I would say in my experience, particularly here in Atlanta, it's it's amazing how many people are kind of willing to help in some capacity or meet with yeah. you. You know, people are very supportive and I, I'm with you. I think you should not be shy about engaging people and um, building those relationships. So yeah, I love it. Those are great pieces of advice. So thinking a little bigger picture, as far as the the, the fight against climate change, which of course is evolving, um, lots lots of, I think, hopefully good momentum building behind, like a, a universal acknowledgement of the problem and the fact that, that action needs to, to be taken. Um, how do you see specifically technology, like its role in that fight um, kind of, kind of ro you know, playing out in the future here? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, so I think the exciting thing about where we are right now in the climate change debate and, and, and the mitigation of it is that we don't really need a new technology breakthrough to save us, right? All the technologies that currently exist are going to continue to get better. Solar is going to get even more cost efficient and even more effective. Ditto wind, um, you know, our battery technologies are going to continue to improve, but even as things currently stand, we've got the technologies we need both to take that first step of decarbonizing the economy and moving off of legacy fossil fuels onto more renewable sources and ceasing putting out um, uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, but then on our end, right, where we're talking about actual removal of carbon from the atmosphere, um, we've also got most of the technologies we need. And that's not to say that there's not exciting new ones on the horizon that are going to continue to come out and, and get more efficient and get better. Um, but we've got what we need to, to solve the problem right now. Um, it's really more of an issue of how do you mobilize, right? How do you get people on board? How do you bring people into the community and get people um, you know, actively engaged in um, taking action to fix some of these problems? Um, and that's, again, that's kind of what our focus is, is you know, we want to make it really easy for you, if you're a concerned consumer, to, to come in, use our app, and fund the removal of carbon from other sources on the planet, right? To, to fund that reforestation project that wouldn't have happened without your support, or to fund that new direct air capture technology that's just coming out of the lab that's starting to have a real real impact and show uh, and show real promise. Um, and so that's, that, that's kind of the point that we're at right now is, you know, it's really more of a coordination issue. And how do you mobilize? How do you get all these technologies out there and more broadly adopted? Because they, they fundamentally exist. It's just a matter of getting them implemented. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really good point. And, and I definitely subscribe to the belief that, you know, technology is a tool, right? And exactly, I mean, some of the best products that have a big impact, they're not 
you know, completely revolutionary technology. They're just combining, you know, these things and engaging different groups in a way that addresses some problems. I'm with you. Not everything has to be solved by AI or blockchain to be really valuable, right? Um, Looks like we are about out of time. Thank you so much, Ed, for doing this. I really enjoyed the conversation. You bet, Richard. Thank you for the opportunity. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah, this has been great. Um, So before we sign off, where can listeners go to connect with you and to learn more about Arbor? Fantastic. Yeah. So you can um, visit us at our website, which is getarborapp.com. Um, or if you want to specifically sign up to be one of our beta, te- beta testers, right, and to try our product before we go into the public market later this year, um, you can visit us at signup.getarborapp.com um, and uh, sign up and be one of our early adopters and help join join us in this um, both in this crusade and also be one of these early people who are giving us feedback and helping us build out a successful product. Um, and obviously we would really love to get your support and help in doing so. So we'd love to have anyone um, who's interested in what we're talking about active in our community. Um, and also obviously we're on every social media channel known to man. Um, we publish a ton on LinkedIn. You can find us at 412 Technology on LinkedIn. Um, we're also active on Twitter, obviously, as well as Instagram. Uh, uh, Arbor Mobile on both platforms. And um, and yeah, just reach out. We'd love to engage with you and get your thoughts and feedback and uh, get you part of the community. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Ed. Uh, it's been great having you on the Digital Footprint. Richard, thank you so much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. It was great talking to you this afternoon. Thank you for listening to the Digital Footprint. This show is brought to you by Tyrannosaurus Tech, an award-winning technology partner dedicated to designing and developing high-impact software products. If you like what you heard in this episode, make sure to subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. For show notes and access to all episodes, please visit tyrannosaurustech.com slash blog.